Hi, this is Jazz Obrecht, and welcome to my Talking Guitar podcast with legendary blues artist Johnny Shines. Long before becoming a force in Chicago blues, Johnny Shines hoboed with Robert Johnson through Depression-era America. They hopped freight trains together, played on street corners, shared rooms and whiskey, and made it as far north as Canada. Johnson passed away in 1938, and for the next half century, his spirit seemed to haunt the music of Johnny Shines. It echoed in Johnny's turnarounds, his mournful bottleneck slides, his impassioned lyrics, and his falsetto moans. At clubs, house parties, and other gatherings, Shines was just as likely to launch into Johnson's Crossroad Blues, Terraplane Blues, and Sweet Home Chicago, as he was his own songs, such as Evil Hearted Woman Blues, A Little Tenderness, and Evening Sun. Raised in Tennessee and Arkansas, Shines took up guitar in 1932, and within three years began his celebrated rambles with Robert Johnson. Shines moved to Chicago in 1941, amplified his guitar, and staked out Frost Corner as his home turf. He also played Tom's Tavern for many years with pianist Sunnyland Slim and worked in nearby Robbins, Illinois with the jazzy Dukes of Swing. Johnny's first recordings, four 1946 sides for the OK Record Company, remained unissued for a quarter century. In fact, bad luck seemed to dog Johnny's recording career the whole time he lived in Chicago. As he described in our interview, around 1953, he pawned his guitar and quit music altogether. He wasn't persuaded back in the into the studio for another dozen years. During the 1970s, though, Johnny became something of a blues celebrity, touring America and Europe and recording for Biograph, Testament, Flyright, Advent, Rounder, and other labels. A kind, intelligent man with penetrating eyes and a subtle wit, Johnny moved to Tuscaloosa, Alabama in 1969. A stroke eventually slowed his fretting hand, but his powerful voice remained remarkably similar to his earliest records, echoing the deep delta blues of a bygone era. He was 73 when I encountered him playing at a house party in California. Our interview took place in a Watsonville farmhouse on January 23, 1989. Midway into the interview, I handed Johnny a framed photograph of Robert Johnson, which had just recently been published for the first time. Johnny hadn't seen this photograph before, and he confirmed that this was, in fact, a photograph of the man he knew. Without further ado, here's my conversation with Johnny Shines. Hope you enjoy it. What led you to, to decide just to give up music, didn't you? Well, I've had some pretty shitty deals. I, uh, I was playing about seven nights a week. And I was uh -huh. turning in three to the union, you know, paying tax on three nights. Right. And they caught up with me because uh, one of my musicians got mad with me. Uh huh. I went to the union and told him what was happening. But now in the meantime, I had the president of the union, my wife and I, my old lady and I had cooked up food and stuff like that, you know, to attract people to come right. in and vote for him. Yeah. And they're trying to kick him out of the union. Yeah. And uh, they, they fined me four hundred and some dollars, and I thought he should have said fine, suspended, or anything. You understand what I mean? Yeah. But he didn't say a damn word. He said, "And there you go." Yeah. You know. And then two, the union never got me a job in my life. Yeah, I know about four that. Four times in the union. Yeah. I paid my dues, sit down there, got damn be in and be out. Never got a job in my life. Boy, I just drive in town, you know, to get jobs. Yeah. And I, I you know. And overlooked me. Yeah. So I felt pretty bad towards the union. Then I was trying to play jazz too. I wasn't doing no good at that. Progressive jazz. This is this is when you had a small band for about seven years playing jazz music. Mm -hmm. Was this in Chicago still? It was in Chicago. Yeah. So I got disgusted. 
went in one night and the goddamn plug was in my door. Plug? The plug was in my door. I couldn't get in, in my door. Uh-huh. Because I hadn't paid my rent. A lot of things happened to me, man. Yeah. Very disgusting. I just got disgusted and just took this shit. So I give it up. Captain Poncho got me on the on it. What, do you remember when that was, roughly? Yeah, about 54. 54. Mm-hmm. What was it like when uh, when you first got to Chicago in September of 41 and, and you uh, took the job at the Santa Fe, what's it, a car repair place? And you were working uh, at Brock's Corner? It was, uh, it was, uh, Chicago, was, a lot of guys were playing then. Yeah. Big Bill Brunner was playing. Martha Crudup was playing. Tavon Red was playing. Uh... Dr. Clayton was singing somewhere. Yeah. Never Slim was singing somewhere. Uh, well, everybody. Played. That was the but, era when even like Memphis Minnie was around. Right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. When she and Sunju was playing. So right. Everybody was playing. Huh. So, pretty soon I got started. Really? Okay. Yeah. It wasn't bad. Were you playing by yourself? Or would you usually work with another guitar player? Like a piano player? Piano player? No, you don't know the guitar player. No. Huh. When you were a kid, weren't uh, weren't there a, a number of people around Helena who play with two guitars together? Oh, yeah. yeah I, you mentioned one one time, this uh, June Clay and Ollie Burks. What were they like? They was good. They was good as a team. They was two stepbrothers. Uh-huh. Mm -hmm. Did you know them when you were young? Mm -hmm, yeah. You started playing, you were a little bit older than mine, 17, I heard. No, I really, 16 when I started playing, but I didn't turn professional until I was about 17. Uh-huh. Did you play anything before guitar? I played a little organ as a kid. Uh-huh. Gospel music, you know. Was there, did you ever hear about, you know, people talk in the old days, some, some people thought of blues as devil's music. Yeah. Oh, yes, it did. Was that something you grew up hearing about? Yes, uh -huh. yeah. Well, when I was a kid, I first heard you singing the blues, like from here over to the mountain over there. If they heard you singing the blues, recognize your voice, you couldn't go around their house, around their doors. Around really? their street, you know. Is that why blues men would travel around? That's why they had blues men. No, that wasn't why they travel around. They would travel around to make paydays and things like that. To make with cash money being out, you know. So you knew how to play the, the night after they got paid, the night the, on the day they got paid? Mm-hmm. Huh. Was most of the work on streets or was it in, in uh, little clubs, roadhouses? Well, yes. Well, when when not many roadhouses at the time. There were little clubs like, you know, and you see after probation was broke, you know, who could come back? Yeah. But then you could go into little taverns and play, you know. Yeah. But you went in on your own. It wasn't hiring me. Uh huh. You went in on your own lots of times. Then lots of people would hire you. But the many times I went in on my own, you know, just went in and sit down. The guy said, You play? Yeah. So you sit around, play as a team with you. You know, you sit there and play all night. A lot of people fishing in the pool and that. Uh huh. But sit there and make yourself seven, eight dollars. Really? That's good money in those yeah, days. Yeah, that was good money in those days. People were waiting for much less than that for a week. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, do you remember uh, the very first songs you ever learned to play? Mm-hmm. Jim String, Bone B Blues, Rolling Tunnel. Jim String? Jim String, Bone B Blues, Rolling Tunnel. Mm -hmm. What's the first song? Jim String. Jim String? Yeah. That was a song about a uh, pimp uh -huh. and his whore. Huh. He killed his whore. And that's what the song's all about. Jim Strain killed Lula one Friday night. Where did you learn that? Well, I learned the song from my brother. Uh huh. Mm -hmm. See, my brother's a guitar player too. Did he ever uh, make a name for himself? No, he never played professional. Uh huh. What was his name? Willie Reed. Uh huh. Mm -hmm. Who is Willie Tango? Well, Tango was a boy around Memphis there. He was one of the good ones, you know, played a lot of popular numbers and things like that. Jazz. Do you knew him when you were a few years older? Mm -hmm. Huh. 
And what about <laughs> Little Buddy Doyle? Little Buddy Doyle was a midget. Well, he was a dwarf, brother. Everybody called him a midget because he was a dwarf. Uh-huh. Because he was wide as your eye across the shore. He was just about that high. Was he a guitar player? Yeah, he was a guitar player. And Alan, Alan Shaw. Alan Shaw had a guitar player. Are these all guys you had hung around with in Helena? No, no, I never. So when you were in Helena, who who did you know? I didn't play well. Uh, used to stack house. About the only somebody. Robert, really, Robert Johnson. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, you met Robert a little later, right? Yeah, thirty-five or something. Mm -hmm. Was that uh, through a piano player? I read. M and O. M and O. I brought you a gift. I don't know if you'd like it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, sir. Uh, Did you have a copy of that? No, I didn't. Great. I'm really glad to get this. Is that the guy? That's him. That's him. Yep, that's him. Do you remember that guitar? No, I don't. Looks to me like a Gibson. No, I don't remember. He sure had beautiful hands, didn't he? But he might be the one that uh, we bought in uh, Steel, Missouri. We bought a flat top in Steel, Missouri. Uh -huh. this, this is not Arch Top. But he you, really, really, he liked that, that uh, Arch Top. Uh, it, uh, Cigarette smoker, too, huh? Mm -hmm, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. He was a little guy, I heard. Yeah, he's a slim. Was he tall as you? Just about. What do you think he would he, he would have thought if he had known just how much it would have meant to people in time? Hello. All right, how are you? Hey. Can I repeat your question? Um, I wonder if he could have known what it what time would have done to him, you know? That fifty years later there'd be guys coming to find you to ask you questions about him or that people would talk about him like like he was Charlie Parker or John Coltrane or somebody. Well to me he was just as great as Charlie Parker. Yeah, to me too. You know, because the man the man did everything they did. Whatever you did on a horn or on a piano, he figured you'd do it on a guitar. He did it. He didn't look for it either. I never seen him practice it. Never seen him look for nothing. Really? Just sit out to your guitar and play it. Whatever you want to play, you play it. Uh huh. Never seen him look for a chord. I don't know many chords he never heard of. He just he didn't make because he couldn't read music. He couldn't. Could he read or write? Yeah, he did. Uh -huh. But I didn't know this until many years later. Just a few years ago, he knew how to read and write. Because he never did write anything. Uh huh. Had a song to do a newspaper, try to read. <laughs> did you do much playing together with two guitars? No, he didn't like that. How would it work? Well, he'd go one way and I'd go the other. We'd work in the streets. Uh, and you'd just walk up and down? Mm hmm. Uh, I go over here and start playing. He go over here and start playing. He draw his gang. I draw mine. Uh huh. Mm -hmm. What kind of a, what would you use for a slide or in a bottom time? neck? How how would you make one? Well, you turn a bottom long neck bottom. You just break it off and try to get some clouds. I'm gonna break it off. But I got out where you could use them. Uh huh. Mm -hmm. Did you see Robert do that? Yeah, I did it too. Hmm. I understand that uh, one of the players that you guys really admired was Lonnie Johnson. Mm -hmm. Lonnie Johnson? Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Was he like the top gun guitar player in those days? Mm -hmm. Was he like the top guitar player in those days? Him? Yeah. Was he one of the top ones? Yeah. He was the top. That's what I wondered. Yeah. Yeah. I've heard that if, if, uh, if he was a very great jazz guitar player, but because he was black, they didn't want him to record that much as a jazz player. Have you ever heard that? I don't know why he didn't record that much, but I know he didn't record that much. Yeah. I remember one record of his was strictly jazz. And boy, he was so mad that fast. Woo! 
Yeah. <laughs> what a street pig. Yeah. Huh. Like, he used three pick like Mary 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 uses three fingers. Yeah. I've seen a guitar player use three fingers when it's fast as him. Huh. Yeah, he had a great left hand too. Mm -hmm. Huh. Did you use a pick in the early days? Uh, yeah, well, we did use a uh, finger picks. Even uh, flat picks of the blow. I had to. But I always use finger picks. What kind of finger picks did they have in those days? The uh, metal ones? Metal ones. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I'll bet guitar strings were pretty awful back then. You broke up a lot of guitar strings. I know. Yeah. Because at that time, <clears throat> I didn't know how to play in all the keys. Right. And I had to use a capo to change keys lots of time. Uh-huh. So that is hard on a guitar string, you know. Yeah. Flatten them down and tune it with the clamp on, you know, pulling it back and off of them. Yeah. And the guitar string would rattle and break. What what would you would they would you have a store bought capo or would you make one yourself? Make one yourself, or you buy one. How, yeah. how do you make a capo? You take a pencil, uh -huh. and string, put the pencil around and make and wrap the string around it from the back side, pull it up tight. Uh huh. Just as good as any capo. Huh. Or maybe rubber bands might work. Mm -hmm. Huh. Once, if when you and Robert were traveling together, what what would you do when you first got to a town? I just try to find out where the black neighborhood was. Uh huh. Take the railroad track, walk down the railroad track, just watch, see which side the black kids on. Uh huh. So the side we find the black kids on, that's the side we go on. Right. Because that's where it was the back side, you know. All the town was segregated then. Yeah. Whites on one side of the track, blacks on the other. Did you, you know, both I, both have a guitar? Mm hmm. And and your clothes, I assume, and that was it. Your clothes on you. Yeah. Mm hmm. Where would you tend, where, like, what would an average playing day be? All day. <clears throat> if the money would still happen. Yeah. Because we didn't have no particular place to go. Yeah. And we just got in a town, that's why I said other people started giving us nickel and dime. That's why we started playing it. Uh huh. That's why we play as long as we were nickel and dime. Was and we quit and we just walk on off. Were there any places where you did uh, better than others, like favorite towns or favorite types of gatherings that was the most profitable? Well, I say Lewis was a profitable town. Uh huh. And uh, Memphis was a good town. Memphis was always good. You never got to be too 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 well known in Memphis. Yeah. Would you play down on Beale Street or? Yeah, I'd go down to Henry's Park and play with the guy down there. Uh huh. You know, guy over here had a big crowd, and you strike up over there. Probably you pull half his crowd, or all his crowd. Uh, you pull all his crowd. That's what we call head cutting. You know, head cutting. He just cut his head. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's pretty good. Yeah, I bet Johnson was pretty good at that. What? <laughs> I once read an interview by you where you said that uh, he played polka music on guitar. Yeah. Even today, I can't think of anyone who can do that real well. <laughs> you know? Great to do it. Yeah. You see, when I, when I come along playing guitar, from that time you wake up in the morning, you didn't have no money at all. And, uh, if somebody asked you to play a song, they, they might as well give you a dollar to play a song. Huh. That meant about four meals out of a dollar. Yeah. Because you can give me a for a quarter. Yeah. About 30 cents, you know. And you couldn't play this song if you missed that money. Right. So you had to learn to play some of everything you heard. Huh. If we passed the place where the white bands and all, you know. Yeah. And they were playing there, the big bands were playing there, you know. Right. Whatever kind of music they were playing, hell, we still had to listen to it. Stood outside and listened to it. Huh. Hide around outside and listened. And so we go on, and we get ready, we play the same piece, you know, play the same piece. That's why your uh, Dukes of Sw uh, Swing used to play uh, Lionel Hampton tunes, right? Mm-hmm. Huh. 
You didn't see that? That's fine. Flying home. Hey, Bobby Rebound. It's ain't like that. So I'm yeah. Up at one time. So if you're traveling or if you were hoboing playing the blues, it actually you'd only play blues once in a while and you play a lot of popular songs in between. A lot of popular songs in between, yeah. What's the other what's, what's the other people seem like to enjoy it more? Uh huh. Do you ever uh, play much for white audiences? Mm -hmm. I heard that this is probably before your time, that, but there was a time where they used to have a stage and they'd have a fence or something between it, and the white audience would be on one side and the black audience would be on the other, and the musicians would play in the middle. Never played the kind of stage. Yeah, this, this was in the 1800s. I, I heard they used to do that. Stage. Yeah. They played for white audience, the white audience, they played for black audience, the black audience. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Huh. Yeah, we played for Polish people. We had played Polish music. Uh huh. Did you learn to sing any of those songs, or was it instrumental? Yeah. Well, yeah, some of them I learned. Like be about Popa, too fat Popa. Several of them I learned. Really? Mm -hmm. Huh. As well as uh. A few Jewish tunes. Yeah. Yeah, learned them too. Huh. Yeah. Now, it's something I've been curious about. When I, you talk about cop and a freight, right? That they used to do that. Would you, like, jump in an empty box car and then just go wherever? What's that? Like? The empty box car was handy. We get in it. If not, we get on it. On the top of it? Mm hmm. And then you're stuck with riding it till whenever it stops, right? Mm -hmm, yeah. Yeah. So they can get upside the head. <laughs> <laughs> Do you think of that as a good time of your life or a Well, it's some of the best of the time. Yeah. yeah, because I had to make my own way through my own skills. Uh-huh. And uh, I felt more free of him than any other time, you know. But now if I got into a town like tonight, on um, Monday night, uh -huh. by Thursday, that'd have me a job somewhere. Because at that time, the police were bad about picking up for banks. Right. And I always had a job to go to. Where you work at? I work at City City Place. Yeah. How long have you been there? About two or three days. He knew, he knew, he knew you when you went there and everything. Because if you was a stranger, everybody knew you was a stranger in town. Uh-huh. Everybody knew everything you did. In a small town thing like that. Yeah. So I'd be working at a gas station, car wash, or gym, or anything, you know? Yeah. Was there ever a time in your life where you just lived solely as a musician? Yes, those was the time. Before Chicago? Yeah, before Chicago. Huh. Yeah, when I was traveling up and down the road, those was the time I was living solely as a musician. Huh. With the exception, I'd get these small jobs, you know? Dishwashing, busting dishes, and something like that. Yeah. And I got into a town that had to say I had a job. I worked for Mr. So and so and so, you know. Police uh -huh. Wait, Did you play guitar all the time in those days? I mean, was it, did you feel like it was part of your soul? Or? Well, it was. Mm -hmm. See, now, these jobs are just for sidelines, just something to keep the police off of me. Uh huh. And I was living off the guitar. I'd come and get off and work in the evening, come and get my guitar and walk down the street and play in a little slow, you know. Uh -huh. So I'd say, hey, come over here. You know? and that's why we pitched a party. I'd come uh -huh. in like this, $70 that night. But I wasn't getting that much for a week's work. Yeah. Getting $4.75 like that, $4.35 like that for a week's work. Yeah. Boy, that was hard. really made it worthwhile. What were your favorite guitars back then? What kind? Hmm? What were your favorite guitars? Well, I had a little black Regal guitar. Regan? Regal. Oh, Regal. Yeah. yeah Regal. Yeah. And later on, I had a Kalamazoo like Robert had. We both had it. What, what was that kind of guitar? Kalamazoo was, yeah. was, a, was a Gibson with the flaw in it. Oh, it was, was that? Um, <coughs> yeah. Okay. So that would be a, uh, a round hole guitar? No, that was, the Kalamazoo then was a hole. What'd you want an arch top for, for the projection? 
So it's loud? Yeah. Huh. Hey, my body's here. Did you have a case for it? No, we didn't have a case. Just <laughs> throw, it, throw it over your back? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Did, 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 did you or Robert spend much time playing guitar when there was nobody listening? No. You wouldn't just play for yourself? Mm -hmm. Huh. What kind of a guy was Tampa Red? Tampa Red was one of the best guys ever was. Very good nature. Kind person. Open man. Sure was close to his wife, wasn't he? Yes, he was. Yeah. They were close to each other. Huh. Those two people were close to each other. Did you get did you know Big Bill at all? Oh yeah. Was he fun? Yeah, Big Bill was fun. <laughs> you know, he was a hell of a guitar player when he was younger. Big Bill, yeah, Big Bill was a hell of a man. Did you know Memphis Minnie? Oh yeah. I understand she was a hellion. Yeah, she was good. Was there something where you two didn't get along? Hey, me? Yeah. No, no. We got along. Huh. I never had no problem out of those Huh. What, when you first started recording, what, why didn't you play slide on those sessions? Well, I did not play slide. Yeah. I didn't want to. Yeah. I was picking pretty good then. Yeah. Did you learn slide and, and picking at the same time when you started out? Well, yes, I did. <coughs> See, uh, my picking. I don't know if you know it's not. Most people think it's two guitars when I'm picking by myself. Yeah. And that's because I leave the camera on the background. Because you, you carry your own background? Mm -hmm. With a, by using four fingers? By using two fingers uh -huh. and the thumb. I leave the camera on the background. I noticed uh, you were doing that on stage by playing the bass line with your thumb. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Steady Mississippi sort of bass. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Would you consider yourself a Delta Blues man at all? Well, that's the biggest I am. I'm sorry? That's what I am, a Delta Blues man. We, we, I'm now considered the king of the Delta Blues. That's right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Did you ever know Sun House? Well, I, I, I learned of Sun House later in, in the years. I didn't know him too long before he died. Huh. What was it? What's a get back? Well, now that's right. Say for instance, you live here and you sell whiskey, pouring whiskey, you know. Uh huh. You know, Saturday night you're going to have a get back. You just take the beds and things down. Uh huh. Probably throw sand on the floor. Yeah. Now that's, that's, that's one way of washing the floor, putting sand on the floor. Yeah. And you put a crap table in the back room back there. Uh huh. Card table or somewhere else, you know. People play cards. And uh, let them dance in here. And the musicians in here. Yeah. And dance there. So you used to play for those? Mm hmm. I, I, I read put a, some. Put a table, put a something across the door, or something across this door here and sell fish. Uh huh. Oh. You barbecue it or fry it? Fried fish. Mm -hmm. Uh huh. I read somewhere that you said once you played, you used to play in places that were so tough they, they used paper cups. So people wouldn't smash yeah. and fight. Mm -hmm. yeah. Really? Yeah. I was playing in a place like that man Memphis and <clears throat> the guy got to fighting with the two other guys and, and, and one of the guys' wife. And the woman cut his guts out. Really? Mm -hmm. She cut him down. Killed him? I'm quite sure she did. Yeah. And he and Walt just picked up herself and walked out. You were with Robert? Walter. Walter Horton. Mm-hmm. Oh, man. You saw him get cut and he fell. Walter and I just walked out because we knew he was just about to leave. She cut his guts out. Oh, man. Did I heard, what was this? He lost some guitars in a fire one time? In West Memphis. What happened there? Well, Rob and I walked out to 
get some food or something, you know. Uh -huh. And uh, on our way back, we looked up, saw this place of fire. I said, Rob, that looked like where we live at. I said, yeah, it should be. Show sure we got there, that's where you want. Uh-huh. Hunt's Motel. Hunt's? Hunt's Hotel, yeah. Hunt's Hotel. This is Black Billy, a little place there. Nothing but a room and a house. Uh-huh. You know, they had a paper wall and things like that. Shit, they were... Well, room, room and a house then wouldn't shit. Yeah. Just a bed, basically, huh? You fell in your room and definitely fell in another room. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> <coughs> was Johnson, a, was he mostly known as a Robert Spencer or Robert Dodds back then? Johnson, all I ever knew. That's all you ever knew? Mm -hmm. There's a story. He didn't tell me anything about the Spencer and Dodds and all that shit. No, he, did he talk much about his stepfather? His stepfather, what he talked about. Do you like him? Yes, he did. Huh. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But now to be talking about his stepfather, I, I never knew which one of his stepfather he was talking about. Yeah, he had some, didn't he? Yeah. Huh. Do you know any of his relatives? Yes, I know one of his sisters. Uh huh. Mm -hmm. And, uh. Were you aware of his records in uh, his lifetime? Mm hmm. Did he have them, or did you hear them on jukeboxes? Yeah, I'm on jukeboxes. Huh. Was he proud of having recorded? He was very proud of it. That the idea. Getting out there. Huh. Which was a damn good idea. He didn't even get out there. Sure had an effect on music. You know, I think of him as one of the very first people to play rock and roll, in a way. Like his boogie beat, it was mm -hmm. different than Blind Lemons and other people's. Mm -hmm. It seems like his is the one that really started it, you know? Maybe as it traveled through other musicians, through you, through Muddy Waters and other people. Mm -hmm. It really, to me, that's one of the first places. Well, it began. I know we played rock and roll, but it just wasn't under the same, not the same beat, but... Uh, just wouldn't call it rock and roll. Yeah. So, did plus, you have Did you have a sense that he was going to have a short life? Hmm? Did you have a feeling that he would have a short life? Rob? Yeah. No, I never did. It was very hard when I heard he was dead. Yeah. I just couldn't believe it. Yeah. There was sure a lot of mystery around it for many years, wasn't there? Well, yes, it was. Tell you the truth about it, <clears throat> Honey Boy Edwards was the one confirmed it with me that he was there. See, Sonny Boy said he, he said Robert died in his arm. Uh -huh. Sonny Boy was such a big liar. This Rice Miller, the other Rice one. Miller, yeah. Rice Miller, such a big liar that I just still couldn't believe Robert was there. I, I just looked in the day to walk up on him somewhere. Yeah. You know? And I traveled around since I've been playing. Professionally, you know? Yeah. Since I made my comeback, I, I looked in the knees and walked upon me. I would walk upon me. Really? Mm -hmm. Do you ever like feel his presence? In yeah, many times. Huh. Many times. Did he have any sit favorite sayings that he used to see <laughs> use expressions? <clears throat> Was he like a hip talking guy? No. Well, he talked a little hip, all right, which we all did, you know, because I was the language at that time. Uh huh. Like, yeah, man, you know. Yeah. Look, David, so and so and so and so, look, David, so and so and so and so, you know, like that. Yeah. I still use it. I call you baby, honey, and you know, thing like that. Yeah. Which, you know, I know you're not a baby, you're not a honey. Yeah. But it's just something that comes out that way, you know? Yeah. And lots of people look at me, you know, and look like they say, is he funny? <laughs> <laughs> There's a story that you played on a radio show in Detroit, the Elder Moton Hour. Yes. Uh -huh. What's that about? Do you recall any Well, he was a preacher. Uh-huh. And he broadcasted out in Canada. And uh, lots of people could pick him up back over in Detroit, you know, all over Canada. Yeah. He was a preacher, a sanctified preacher. Uh-huh. And he wanted a lot of music with him. Outfit, you know. He had a pretty, pretty good sized choir. Yeah. 
Robert Calvin and myself, we'd go over and play for him. Calvin? Calvin, that was my first girl. Uh huh. And he, he, he had to leave the United States. Calvin did? Yeah. What was his last name? Frazier. Oh, yeah, right. <coughs> and uh, do you, when, what, did you play blues on a preacher's show? No, no, no. <laughs> no, no, no. I'm playing gospel music. That's what you and Robert did when the one time you broadcast? Mm -hmm. Do you remember uh, what type of songs it might have been? Yes. Uh, the regular gospel song like uh, Ship of Zion. Uh, Stand by me. When the saints go marching in, that's the woman in glory now, see some of that. Yeah. What's the story on uh, Take Your Closer Walk With Me? Did Robert Johnson write that? No, no. It's, that's been written, you know. Uh, yeah, but Robert didn't write it. Just a closer walk with me? Yeah, that's it. No, Robert didn't write that. Huh. We met that song in the road. Huh. Was it true he could hear something once or twice and then he just come He could hear it once. Not twice, once. It's like we sitting here talking on the radio we playing. Yeah. If Robert heard something on the radio he liked, he never stopped talking with you. He ran on talking to you. Tonight or tomorrow or sometime all these people get time to play the song. Note for note, chord for chord, word for word. The only other person I've ever heard that about is Mozart. Mm -hmm. Mozart, the great classical composer. Yeah. They said he could do it. That's amazing. I've never have you ever met him? Way before his time, and so man had to go. Huh. He was a genius. Huh. See, why I say he was a genius because chords, the thing that he had never heard before, he'd hear it on the radio. He never found to look for that chord. He just picked up a guitar and make it. Uh huh. Would you keep your guitars in an open tuning or regular? Regular tuning. Really? Most time. Yeah. Even for slide. Mm -hmm. Even for bottleneck? No, we tune them in open G and open A for bottleneck, open D. Uh huh. Which one was, was called basketball? That was open, open A. Open A. So you tune oh, up. Mm -hmm. when, when did you get your first electric guitar? I got, well, I, uh, I bought a Kalamazoo in Chicago, another Kalamazoo, and I used a Delman pickup on it, uh -huh. which electrified it. Yeah. That was in 41, 42. 42. Mm -hmm. Was Robert Nighthawk already in town then? Well, he came to town. Uh -huh. He wasn't already there. He had been there. Though. Yeah. Robert Nighthawk and Honey Boy had been every guy there. Up huh. and down, you know, down in the city, really. North and south. Is, is, is it fair to say that Muddy Waters is the guy who was the most responsible for changing the sound of blues in Chicago? Well, I think uh, Muddy used his style, which was a Mississippi style yeah. of singing. And he changed the style of music, you know what I'm saying? He threw Willie Dixon. Uh huh. See, a lot of people don't give Willie Dixon no credit for things that happened. Willie Dixon was the man that changed the style of the blues in Chicago. As a songwriter, producer? As a songwriter, and producer. That man, is, that man is a genius. Yeah. 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 And so, you want a hit song, go to Willie Dixon. Play it like he said, play it and sing it like he said, sing it. Even Willie Dixon can't sing a lick. Yeah. But just find out what he's talking about and do it. You damn near got a hit. Yeah. <laughs> and in the days before that, wasn't the big writer, and way before your time actually, wasn't the big writer in town uh, Tom Dorsey. Weren't Tampa Red and Tom Dorsey the big songwriters in Chicago in the 20s and 30s? Well, he probably was, but he was a jazz musician. Yeah, and then he became a gospel guy and kind of didn't want to... What, what led you to, to start a jazz band in the early 40s? Well, I didn't start a jazz band. A boy named Reed, he came over. He wanted a guitar player. He came over. Well, I've been wanting to play jazz anyway. Uh huh. And he wanted somebody to back him up. He was a damn good lead jazz guitar player. 
Yeah. When somebody's back him up, you know, and they pause behind it. The chord, you know, I said, I went over a lot of songs. I learned the chords and play like that, you know? Yeah. Learn how to make them. And we just went from there as a jazz outfit, you know? Yeah. We picked up a piano player, ladies. Man, I don't even need them. Where did you get such a powerful voice? <laughs> I don't know. Is it from singing in places without electricity? No, I've always had a powerful voice. When I was a little, 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 little boy like this, uh -huh. I used to stand and squeal. You know how children squeal? You just yell? Just squeal, you know? Uh -huh. Hey! You know, like oh, that. right. Like whooping. And uh, people could hear me for half a mile. <laughs> really? Yeah. <laughs> uh, you poor like a person, you know, whistles. Yeah. That's where I squeal, you know. Yeah. And the same sound. Huh. And I could call my auntie from over here, my uncle from over there, you know. <laughs> That's funny. Yeah. I know the loudest whistler I've ever heard is a woman who's about 65 years old, and she makes your ears ring when she whistles next to you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's my aunt. I had an aunt just died here a couple of years ago. She died here in Compton. Uh-huh. She could whistle. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Are any of your kids musicians? Not, not much. Either. I understand your wife's quite quite a good singer. She is. Yeah. That's what I'm trying to do. I'm trying to bring her and my own band back out of here. Uh-huh. Who is sticking, you know? Sticking? Yeah, I mean, playing good. Yeah. The band. Because it plays for my wife and it plays for me. Is this uh, the guys on the tape? Is this your band? Well, I probably would use him, but he's not really not in the band. No. Bart Pate? Bart okay. Tate. No, he's not in the band. Huh. What's the best band you ever played in? Best band I ever had was uh, the Dukes of Swing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Did you do any of old, uh, any of uh, the Mississippi type blues songs with that band? I did. Yeah. Mm -hmm. With them, it could be arranged in any way, yeah. Well, you, you said you were playing a Kalamazoo guitar with this band? Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Did you have a, a regular club you played at in Chicago, or did you uh, just move around town during the... Well, uh, yes, I played at regular places. Now, Frost's Corner, I played there, that was on the north side. Uh-huh. And... Uh, I played at uh, mm, I played at uh, Tom's Tavern, Sunnyland. I played there for a long time. Then I played out in Roberts. That's when I had the Dukes of Swing. Mm -hmm. Played out there for about three years. Out where? At Robbins, Illinois. Robbins. Uh huh. Did you play at like a supper club or was it a a dance place. It really was a, a club. Uh huh. You know, a club. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Which a few people did dance. But most of the people come in to listen and drink. Yeah. And have a good time, you know. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Would you play slide guitar with that band? <clears throat> mm hmm. <clears throat> what, what advice would you give a guy who wants to, like, pick up slide, especially on acoustic? Say a young fella who's got some talent. What are the important things you got to know? Is learn all these chords on with the slide. Yeah, as far as learn the chords, which is the complement with the slide to uh -huh. the accompaniment. Learn that, learn how to place the slide, and then you go from there. Now, do you do, are you one of the people who believe that you should wear it on your little finger or your ring finger? Well, wear it, wear it on the finger you're most comfortable with. What are you most comfortable with? Well, I'm most comfortable wearing it on my little finger. So you can chord with your other fingers. Mm -hmm. Do you do you think it's a good idea to lay your other fingers on the string to damp behind the slide, or do you like the sound without it? Well, it's depending on what you want to do. Uh huh. If you want to heal, well, then you heal behind the slide. If you don't, well, then you just let the slide in. What do you think makes the Mississippi Delta slide so different from all the other types? Well, uh. Get out, get out, get out. I don't want to play. Get down. Shh. 
shoot. <laughs> I can do without little dogs. <laughs> I can do without dogs, period, in the, in the house. Yeah, I read you. <laughs> <laughs> I, don't, I don't deal with dogs in the house. <laughs> Neither does my dad. No, and I like dogs. I we got dogs. hunting dogs, but they stay outside. That's right. Yeah. I like working around. dogs. Yeah. What kind of dog you made again? Oh, right now he's racing basset hounds. We, nice. We've had beagles for, for about 15 years. We had Springer Spaniels. These are all field dogs. They go out hunting. They, he runs them for every day of the year. They're out there. He's got a pack of Bassets right now, purebreds. They're kind of uh, kind of stupid dogs, but they sure can chase a rabbit good. Yeah. Yeah. I like them. They're, they're friendly. and They're just about this high off the ground, but they got a huge head, big ears. Big snout, giant feet. Yeah. Yeah. That's another breed of bloodhounds, I think. Really? Yes, I really do. Huh. They sure have a scent, but I wouldn't say catch it. Ferocious hunters. Mm-hmm. Do you do much hunting? Uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh-huh. What do you like? Deer. Rabbit. Uh-huh. Quail. Quail's a good good sport. Mm-hmm. I doe hunts here before. fall. What, what, what's your favorite deer rifle? I don't use a rifle. We use? We use shotgun. With uh, one or two slugs in it? Yeah. Yeah. I got an old uh, Winchester 30-30 lever, yeah. lever action rifle. In fact, I got two of them, and uh, that's my all-time favorite. I don't know why, but something about that gun, it's just, <laughs> feels right. Well, <laughs> depending on what you like. Yeah. What you're best with, you're most comfortable with. Yeah. And I got a 8 millimeter rifle. Uh-huh. That uh, I use once in a while to steal hunt, you know? Yeah. But the rifle shoots so darn far, you miss a deer, no telling what you're killing on the road somewhere else, you know? Yeah, that's right. But with that shotgun, you miss a deer, you, you can down there see what you keep, you know, where yeah. the shot's going. It's not going to go more than a couple hundred yards. No. Well, you never can tell. Really? Um, a shot goes much further than the person think it does. Really? Huh. I read I read about how far shots going, what size shots, how far they travel. It's a mistake. They travel much further. Huh. Depending on what they hit, huh. what angle it, it hits it at. I know a twenty-two shell can go a hell of a long ways. Mm -hmm. you know, one of those long rifles? Yeah, a fellow come out of a place one night, and someone struck him in the leg, and he put his hand down there, and they were bleeding. Come to find out he hit with a twenty-two, and nobody never heard his twenty-two or nothing. Someone probably shot it a mile away. Probably the fellow. Yeah. Did you ever carry a gun during your rambling days? Mm-hmm. Pistol? Mm-hmm. And not too much because you started to being attacked by the police at any time. If you had a gun on you, then you went to jail. Yeah. Gun, see? Huh. Did Robert carry one? No, Robert didn't carry one. Was he a, a, a peaceable person? Until he started drinking. Yeah. <laughs> he started drinking. He, he, do any goddamn thing. Nothing too good for anything. What do you like to drink? I wouldn't have one thing to drink. No, the fish made whiskey at that time. What was that? Corn liquor. Uh huh. And uh, chin high when the, when the bun and liquor come in, chin high and Dixie Dew. Uh huh. It was cheap brand of whiskey we drank that. Because that's what we were able to buy. We buy a better brand once in a while, such as. Old Taylor, old granddad, old fish shell, you know. Yeah. Were you ever much of a drinker? That's all I would be. Really? Huh. Yeah. I had to have it when I went to bed, I had to have it when I woke up, I had to have it when I got up. Is this when you were younger mm -hmm. or all through your life? Pretty well all through my life. Huh. Pretty young or so. Did, do you ever regret be, be becoming a blues man? <clears throat> no, not really. Was it worth it? Well, the experience has been worth it, yes. Uh-huh. Mm-hmm. I, I, uh, like the crowd we had uh, Saturday night, 
Yeah. I enjoy as a crowd like that. Yeah. I can sing better to them. I can play better to them. You know. Were they dancing or? Oh yeah, they was dancing. And just a, a hell of a damn nice crowd. Uh huh. One of some people. Oh, that's great. So I enjoy that. And I don't, I don't really enjoy playing these small clubs where only 50 or 100 people in there, you know? Yeah. Because I feel like when I got a big crowd like that, I know they come to dance. They come because they want to hear me. Yeah. When I got 50 people in the damn club, I don't know where they come. They're going to come anyway or not. Yeah. Because they must be a regular patient, you know, regular yeah. patrons of the place. Yeah. What's the... Uh, uh... What's the compliment that, that you appreciate the most after a gig? Well, like, uh, <coughs> we used to be playing at the end of the night. One of the greatest companies was we sold a box of, a box of tapes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that was telling me something, you know? Yeah. That's better than spoken words, you know? People appreciate your, your music well enough to buy a whole box of tapes. Yeah. Right. When did you make this tape? Last year? No, this year. You went after after you uh, came out of retirement to do the Chicago Blues Today thing. Mm -hmm. You went on a tour of Europe with Willie Dixon. Yeah. What was that? Mm -hmm. What was that all about? Well, we're, uh, our booking agent booked us over there. Uh huh. So we had to go over there. We wanted to stay together. We had to go. But me, I said I'd never ride a plane. And when I knew anything, I damn was in the airport. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I was in the airport. I looked out there and it's being beat to Inbury sitting out there. I said, shoot. <laughs> I'm not going to get on that thing. <laughs> and I thought about uh, Willie Dixon's big family. Walter Harden couldn't do nothing but play music. And uh yeah, his only job. Yeah. Yeah. Son of Man, as big as he could do at that time with playing music. And if I don't go, it's gonna break the gig up, you know? Yeah. So I went on and got on the plane, I drank seventeen jiggers between them dudes and Dolph Jeremy. Have mercy. Still didn't get drunk. <laughs> oh, too much. Why did you move back to Alabama? Well, my daughter died and left a bunch of kids. Oh, I'm sorry. And uh, I had a problem renting in Chicago. Uh-huh. And we were staying in the kitchen there, just wasn't room for them. Yeah. So we had to make some better arrangements. So my wife, she went to Alabama. Uh, vacation. She found his house down there. She called back and told me about it. I told her, I said, she liked it. She said, yes. I said, let him get it. So she got it. And I just packed up everything and moved on down. Uh-huh. Did you raise the children then? Mm-hmm. Were there a number of them? Yes. There were seven of them. Boy. And one of my own made eight. Uh-huh. Three adults. My wife, my, my mother, and myself. Never a dull moment. No. It was fun, though. Yeah. How long have you been married? Uh, that wife and I stayed together about 16, 17 years. Uh huh. Now, you had a band called the Stars of Alabama for a while. Yeah. What was that? Was that a blues band? It was a, blues, it was a band, period. Uh huh. Not just a blues band. Was uh, the Velvet Vampire recorded out in Hollywood? Yes, it was. <laughs> that was a great story you told. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, that was a cool Wasn't that like a softcore porn flick almost? Mm -hmm. Wasn't that almost like a softcore porno flick? Well, I really don't know what the meaning. Was yeah. was it like naked uh naked vampire girls movie? No, no, I no. wouldn't say naked just uh huh. But you know you could tell that it was related to being naked, you know, and thing like that. Yeah. Well, it was this woman, she come in, this man sitting up playing the guitar, you know, and singing the blues. Yeah. She sits down and it affects her mind, you know. She began to think about these things, you know, as he's singing about. Uh-huh. And uh, 
whatever he was singing about, that's where our mind is, you understand what I mean? Yeah. But she finally recovers herself and walks out. And that's when many other things begin to happen, you know. Did you just do the title song or did that's you? That's all. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Did it come out on a record? No, no, I never did. <clears throat> now, during the 70s, uh, you recorded several for several different labels, right? Mm -hmm. Do you uh, do you like the one you did in England? Black and Blue? Yeah, didn't you do a record for uh, Blue Horizon? Blue Horizon, yes. I did do one for Blue Horizon. Yes, I like that one. I thought, I thought it was a pretty good record. A lot of different companies copied some of the tunes up of it. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Put them on their, on their label. Well, that's one way of telling whether your record is good or not. Other companies want to put them on their label. And, uh, yeah, that's true. Have you written any songs lately? Saturday. Saturday? I mean, a couple days ago? Mm hmm You wrote a song? Mm hmm What is it? Well, it's uh, I don't remember the title. <laughs> <laughs> what 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 are you, what do you think your best songs are? The ones you'd love most like to be remembered for? Well, I really don't know. <clears throat> uh, that's one. I don't know. That's the name of it. That's the name of it. Yeah. I don't know. Yeah. And uh, a big tenderness. I thought if you remember from that one. And nobody's fault but mine. When she was a gospel song, people think it's a blues. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's a great song. And, uh, Sun of that and uh, Evening Sun. Those are the songs that rest in people's mind most of them. It's isn't it amazing how the blues transcends time and race and so many things to speak to so many people on so many levels. Well, you see, blues don't have no no race. Blues don't have no level. The blues is just like that. What do you mean? Everybody's gonna have the blues. If they haven't already had them, mm -hmm. they're gonna have them. Because everybody's gonna have some bad luck in their life. Uh They're going to be confronted with fortune, unexpected. It's going one way or the other. Yeah. And uh, <clears throat> the blue is only a thought, anyway. Is it? It's not just about hard times, though. It's about seducing about someone, everything. about love making, mm -hmm. about children. Mm -hmm. Don't you think? That's right. And you see, uh, what's ever touches the heart. Whatever what? Whatever touches the heart. Yeah. That's where the blues come from. Yeah. Say for instance, a man might go out here to the racetrack and win fifteen or twenty thousand dollars at the racetrack. And he'll have happy blues. Yeah, sure. <laughs> Real happy. Because he's happy from the heart on out. From the inside out. And the man go out there and lose all his money. His wife had told him she's going to quit him if he loses money again. He got a different blues. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what kind of blues do you have now? Well, right now I got the I want to go home blues. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you'll be heading back pretty soon. <laughs> <laughs> but I knew that was coming. Yeah. I knew that was coming before I left on. Did you do uh, much playing before you came out? Yeah, I played last while. I really 
I played the Chucker. I played the Getaway. Friday. My wife played the Getaway Friday night. Lisa's in Tuscaloosa. Mm-hmm. So how many nights a year do you reckon? Chucker, the Getaway, the L and N. I played those three jobs. L and N. And the first one is Chucker. 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 C H U C K E R. Those are all in Tuscaloosa. Mm-hmm. How, um, how many? How many? Uh, <coughs> How many nights a year do you figure you're, you're playing? Oh, I don't have the slightest idea. Uh huh. Not stadium, 40. Do you have any uh, any views on the guitar after playing it for about 60 years? Mm -hmm. Do you have any views, anything you can say about guitar after playing it for? Well, guitar is a wonderful instrument. If you learn to use it, Effectively, a wonderful instrument. Now, the guitar I traded off for the one I got here now. Uh huh. The acoustic guitar. Yeah. And just think about it. I bought a home, fed 11 people and closed them. This I let it around holy. Wow. That means a lot to me, that guitar. <laughs> I traded off for this one here and going to get it back. What, what what guitar was that one? That was a Gibson. Did you have it? B-35. B-25. How long had you had it? Uh, so let me have a guitar in Sydney. Blind fella. Huh. Jeff Butcher. Huh. He came over to my house. I was teaching. I had a bunch of guys that I was teaching guitar. He sit there he whistle all the time, you know. He sit there and listen. And uh, finally, when I quit, class broke up and everything. He said, It's the first time I ever heard a blues man teaching guitar. Yeah. He said, Why you don't have an acoustic guitar? I said, I just don't have one. So he didn't say anything else. A few days later, one of the students come back over and he had his guitar with him. He said, Jeff said, Use his guitar until he asked for it. Oh, wow. What yeah. a nice thing. Because I was, I was trying to teach with an electric guitar, which was yeah. a little too rash for that. used to get to. Huh. And then we get the correct sound, you know? Yeah. So I used a guitar. I went to England with it. I come back. Then I went to Germany with it. Come back. I went to Sweden with it. Come back. <laughs> <laughs> The guitar case was tore up because it was torn up almost when I first got it. Yeah. It wasn't very good. And just two or three trips, you know, I really finished it off. So I had to buy another case. Yeah. So I bought a pretty good case for the guitar to go in because I was traveling, you know, and hopping on your planes and things. Yeah. So one Sunday he came over, John Earl brought him over, and uh, he, uh, So it's a nice case you bought. You know, I think, I'm thinking he wasn't going to know the difference about him being yeah. blind. Because he picked it up, did that. He said, a nice case you bought. <laughs> I said, thank you, Jeff. <laughs> I said, well, that's a nice guitar in that case, you know. He said, why so? I said, after all, I'm feeding 11 people out of it. Yeah. I said, I think it's a hell of a good guitar. <laughs> so he sat there and he played the guitar a while. And finally, he put it back in the case and set it down. He walked out and left it. Wow. So he was having a pretty rough time. Him and his wife, his wife was fixing to have a baby and trying to get the bill, money for the bill and everything together. So John L. told me about it. I said, maybe he'll sell me that guitar now that he'll give me. Yeah. Maybe he'll accept some money for it. John L. said, I'm quite sure he will. So I think I gave $200 for the guitar. He was glad to get it. Uh -huh. And you traded that for this one? Mm -hmm. What's the what's the guitar you're playing now? Do you know the make? The uh, Alvarez. Uh huh. Why did you swap them? Because I thought I'd get more action out the Alvarez than I was the Gibson. Oh, I see. Yeah, sure. Yeah. The Gibson was a very comfortable guitar, easy to handle and everything. Yeah. But I thought I'd get more action out of this. What are your plans for the future? Well. Uh, I really want to uh, 
get myself together and buy me a nice small farm someplace. You yeah. know, that's what I really want is a small farm. Uh huh. But it looked like we're gonna have to settle for a house and lot because I'm gonna try to have to get it through the Grants Association. Yeah. Because I really, I'll never make money enough out here to buy a house. Yeah. Now, you know, not at this age. Yeah. Now the other house I got, I got it very cheap. Just a few hundred dollars, you know, back money on it. Yeah. The man I paid into it, <clears throat> and I was taking up the payments. And went from there. The payments were very small, less than a hundred dollars a month. Oh, that's great. So that's the way I did. And I had the house just about paid for when my wife and I separated. After I left, where she started borrowing money on the house, uh-huh. and she borrowed so much money on the house she couldn't make the payments. So the house is just sitting there now. So we're still nobody put her out the house or nothing. She has moved out because she knew she couldn't make the payments. She figured sooner or later it's gonna set her out. Yeah, you know. So she just, she just moved out. Yeah, she left the house sitting there. Open. Hmm. You're what, 70 something now? 73. 73. Mm-hmm. No thought of retiring, huh? No, not yet. <clears throat> got too much to do. Yeah, my dad's 69 and he's the same way. He just got himself that small farm. Yeah. And that's what I want a small farm, five or 10 acres, preferably a 10 acre farm. I yeah. put a nice catfish lake on it. Uh huh. A nice trout lake, you know? Yeah. Let people come and fish, have fun. I like to see people enjoy themselves. Do you like to garden? I love to garden. Having about an acre of garden space. Just one acre would be enough. Sure. Mm-hmm. One little tractor. One little tractor. Yeah. Uh, this rotilla. I like this rotilla that yeah. to make. You know the tines on the back? Yeah, sure. Mm-hmm. I like to see it. <coughs> You'll probably always be interested in music. Oh yes, I love I love music. See, I can hear something in all kind of music that's good. Yeah, makes me know different ways. Jazz, uh, pop, rock, ballad, yeah, gospel. Yeah, symphony. Yeah, music that makes me different. I hear something. It's good. Arrangement, business arrangement. It's, some some kind of beat or something, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. A rundown or something. Huh. A stationary chord or a movable chord. I can always hear something in music that's good for me. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Well, this covers what I'm looking for. Yeah, I love all music. I can listen to all music. Some people say, I can't stand this. I can't stand bluegrass. Heck, I, I like bluegrass. Yeah. No? Huh. And mountain music? I like mountain music. I do too. I like the old country music that's kind of out of tune mm-hmm. from what we're used to hearing. Roll, it wasn't Roland and Tom, when Roland and Tom, when that was kind of, uh, if you hear the 1920s recordings of that, it's kind of tuned differently than the way we tune today. Yeah, well. That was a version done by that with Muddy Waters and Little Walter I really and don't Leroy know. Foster. I really don't know. I don't remember it. Yeah. Leroy Foster was a hell of a guy. Was he? Yeah. They call him Babyface, didn't they? Babyface Leroy, yeah. <laughs> what was he like? <laughs> he was fun, man. <laughs> so he started lying. He'd get up on one foot and started walking off on one foot, you know, just turn his foot that way. And he'd do that for a half a block. <laughs> really? Hopping on one foot? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> he lied his cat off. <laughs> Did you ever know, run across a street singer named Ar- Arvella Gray? Oh, yes. I was friends with him. I got to know him. and I spent a lot of time with him near the end of his life. I, I had a real strong feelings for the guy. He came and stayed with me for a while out here. Oh, yeah? I'm missing a couple of his fingers. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, uh, a blind guy cussed him out one night. He was blind, and I felt him great come up the street playing the guitar. 
He asked me, that, what the hell are you walking down the street flowing on that goddamn guitar for? Trying to make a living. I said, hell, the government takes care of you. You don't have to try to make no living. <laughs> I'm blind just like you. I said, you don't hear me run up down the street flowing on no goddamn guitar. I said, the state takes care of you. You don't tell me you got to try to make no living no damn guitar. I said, you get enough to live off of. Yeah. He said, I got a wife and three kids, and I get enough to live off of. And I live in comfortable. Uh-huh. He said, and if you ever wanted to, when you, when you first got by, so you could have went out and got yourself a tree. He, yeah. he was doing some kind of work. And all yeah. Kind of yeah. And he said, the money he gets from the <clears throat> government enough to take care of him and his wife and three kids. Huh. He didn't have to flag up and put on him. He said, that's what I call munching off of people. I don't know. I think Arvello was a pretty brave guy to do that, you know? He told me that when he first started, he sound, he sounded so terrible that people used to come by and put a nickel in his cup and they'd say, here's a quarter going down the street with that noise. <laughs> 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 and they'd lie about how much they gave him. <laughs> <laughs> and he said that, uh, that uh, he didn't even know how to tune it till Memphis Mini showed him one day. Um, and he said some guy would charge him a nickel to tune his guitar for him, and he lost so much money that he had to learn how to do it himself finally. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, Bo Diddley. Bo Diddley's drummer used to play with me. You know, uh -huh. Bo, Diddley, Bo Diddley had to give his band up, so I took his band over and he gave it up. So the drummer, him and Bo Diddley started out together when he was sure playing. Uh huh. And he said when they first started playing, they'd go in a place, you know, a tavern and get a job playing, and they'd come in at night and set up and everything. And Bo Dilly get his guitar and he'd get the drum. So after a while, I got there, the man come over and throw Bo Dilly out. So he knew he was next. He just get up and chewed his booty out. So the man grabbed me and seated the pay. <laughs> <laughs> he, he said, then here come the guitar, and then here come his drums. And then he picked the shit up and put it in the car and go on the house and wear it. That's funny. <laughs> I heard a story that when uh, Muddy Waters first started recording, he used to go around and uh, he had him and Little Walter and some other, maybe it was Big Crawford, called themselves the Headhunters, and they'd go around and try to cut other blues bands in contests mm -hmm. in different towns around Illinois. Did you ever know about that? No, I didn't know anything about that. Yeah, he, he said... Because really, he was, was maybe a famous leader. That's who it must have been, yeah. Mm -hmm. And uh, I heard that... Uh, um, Little Walter could play guitar. He could. Yeah. Huh. Was uh, Howlin' Wolf the first uh, guitar player you knew about? No, 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 no. But my brother was a guitar player. Uh huh. Did he teach you when you first started? No, my brother didn't teach me. He tried to show me how to play the bone deep blues, and I learned that from him. Uh huh. Jim String, I learned that from him. The one I learned that from him. But, uh, and come to the heavy stuff, I had to go somewhere else, else, you know. Where was that? I had to go to somebody else, you know. Like, would it be Burnham or Willie Tango or Eddie Van? Some of those guys. They'd, they'd just be happy to show it to you? Yeah, yeah. they'd show it to me. Huh. Was there ever a time when people referred to you as Little Wolf? Yeah. When was that? That was when I first started playing. How'd that come about? You see, I was playing mostly songs that Wolf was saying around the people. Yeah. Because I didn't know too many other songs. And when I started, I started on Wolf's guitar. How, how'd that happen? Wolf says, guitar down. To take a break. Take a break. And I sit there and watch him at night. And I said to myself, hell, I can do what Wolf's doing. So I picked his guitar up and started just freeing the hell out of it, you know. Uh -huh. Saying this song. So when Wolf come back, I had the giant jumping, you know, everybody was dancing, going, it was like it was when he was playing. <laughs> uh, That's funny. I sit the guitar down. Uh, before that, they called me Jim Strain. Huh. After that, they started calling me Little Wolf. So all around through the country, they called me Little Wolf, you know. Yeah. And I started playing it professionally. They still called me Little Wolf. Hmm. But Little Wolf died out. It was Johnny Shine, Johnny Shine, Johnny Shine, you know. Yeah. Yeah, the wolf died out. Were you were you born was your born name John Shines? John Shines, that's right. No middle name? John Ned Lee Shine. What's the middle name? John Ned Lee. Ned Lee Shine. Ned two middle names. 
Is that from your grandparents or something? That is from uh, my uncle and great uncle. Ned was uh, my great uncle, and Lee uh-huh. was my uncle. Yeah. When's the first time you ever saw electric guitars being used? Electric guitar being yeah. used? I think the first electric guitar I saw being used was being used in Chicago by Big Bill or some of them. Anyway, I went out where Mrs. Minnie was playing it. She's playing it at Don's Den at the time, which is that time called the White Elephant. Uh-huh. I went out there. She was playing electric guitar at that time. But I don't know if I saw Big Bill playing before that or not. I really don't remember. Yeah. I hear he was real helpful with getting guys gigs. and He was. Yeah. Real helpful. Huh. Big Bill was. Well, Tom Red, same way. Those two guys were mountain of men, you know, the wise musician. Yeah. Um, John, De- blind John Davis told me that when Tampa Red's wife died, he just didn't have any heart left and didn't much want to play or do anything anymore. Did you find that to be the case? From a tavern? Yeah. But I wasn't around Tampa after his wife died. Oh, you weren't? Uh, do you remember the house that Lester Melrose had? Or Tampa's house? Where they'd record? Yeah, well, they didn't record that at all. It was a rehearsal place? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Huh. Did it come as a surprise to the blues community when uh, white people started to pick up on it in the 60s? Well, that's when it became rock and roll, yes. Yeah. I'm quite sure it was quite a surprise to most of us. Because a lot of us said we weren't going to play no rock and roll. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So many said they never play rock and roll until playing rock and roll now. Do you still perceive a segment of, of of the black society that doesn't approve of blues? Are there still holdbacks to that? Well, yeah, you got a lot of black people that uh, don't go for blues. It's because they think the blues is a, is a degraded type of music towards black people. Hmm. Not because they don't like it. They say they don't like it, you know? Yeah. It's like I was working at Raytheon. A bunch of girls there. Found a lot of music. You don't play that Muddy Water stuff, do you? I said, yes, I do. <laughs> Same stuff Muddy Water playing. That's what I play. I don't like that. I like jazz. <laughs> okay, then you go with your jazz. <laughs> so one night I got off kind of early, and I went by the 7 or 8 club where Muddy was playing. And that's all All those girls in there. That's where they were, the 7 or 8 club. So when I walk in and started hiding myself behind the tables, you know. <laughs> the face behind the table. So quick as I quick as I walked in, somebody called me, come on up here, come on up here and get this guitar. Come on up here and get this guitar. I went up and started playing, you know. So I got it playing good and he has popped up, you know. Yeah. So I, <laughs> I said, I'm glad to see a lot of my friends here that I worked with out the Raytheon. You know? <laughs> 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 I said, even though I know they don't like blues, I said, but they're here for some reason. I said, I don't know what the reason is. Yeah. I said, Muddy, you're a great man. I said, you, you, you draw people out here to say they don't like blues. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's great. Yeah. So, it must have surprised people to find out, you know, who you were after you were working for them for a little while. Yeah. Working with them. Yeah, it did. <laughs> that money when I went to work. A lot of people, they stay way back from me, you know, because it, it's really like going to say something about, I saw you say it tonight, I saw you say it tonight. I, I, I didn't do, say nothing until that's when I was doing what I was doing. Yeah. So finally, two or three come over. Well, sure, yeah. We think you play is nice. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> but you didn't have to try to make us feel bad. <laughs> I didn't try to make you feel bad. I said, I try to make you feel good. Let's just make you bring your head up and enjoy yourself. <laughs> you wasn't enjoying yourself trying to hide behind those tables. You know? <laughs> well, we let you do what I saw you and everything, then you can just straighten up. And yeah. Enjoy yourself. That's funny. Portions of the interview you've just heard were published in the March 1990 issue of Living Blues magazine. Johnny passed away two years later on April 20, 1992. Before signing off, I want to thank my podcast producer, Nick Hunt, 
and the fine folks at the University of North Carolina Southern Folklife Collection. This podcast is copyright 2023 by Giles Obrecht, all rights reserved. Thanks for listening.